Live from Vancouver, Canada, it's theCUBE. Covering OpenStack Summit North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the OpenStack Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of OpenStack Summit 2018 in Vancouver. I'm Stu Miniman with my co-host for the week, John Troyer. Happy to welcome back to the program. Stefan Fable, who is the Director of Ubuntu Product and Development at Canonical. Mm -hmm. Great to see you. Yeah, great to be here, thank you for having me. All right, so, uh, Boy, there's so much going on at this show. Uh, we've been talking about uh, doing more things uh, and <laughs> in more places is uh, the, the theme that the OpenStack Foundation right. uh, put into place. And uh, we, we had a great conversation with Mark Shuttleworth mm -hmm. and uh, going to dig in a little bit deeper on, on some of the areas with you. Uh, okay, so absolutely. we have the cube and we're going to go into all the Kubernetes kube flow <laughs> and uh, all those other things that we'll mispronounce uh, how they go. Yes, so, yes, absolutely. Uh, what, 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 what's, uh, what's your impression of the show, first of all? Well, I think that is, it's really a, uh, it, you know, I think there's a consolidation going on, right? I mean, we really have the people who are serious about open infrastructure here, uh, serious about OpenStack, they're serious about Kubernetes. Uh, they, they want to implement, and they want to implement at a speed that, you know, fits the agility of their business. They want to um, really move quick with the upstream release. They, I think the time for enterprise hardening uh, uh, delays and inertia there is over. I think people are really looking at you know, the core of OpenStack, that's mature, it's stable, it's time for us to kind of move, get going, get a success early, get it soon, then grow. And I think uh, most of the enterprises, most of the customers we talk to adopt that, uh, uh, that notion. Yeah, one of the things that it sometimes helps is, help us lay out the stack a little bit here, <laughs> because uh, we, 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 we actually uh, commented that some of the base infrastructure pieces, we're not talking as much about, because they're kind of mature, but right. OpenStack, very much at the infrastructure level, your compute, storage, and network need to understand, but then when we start doing things like Kubernetes, well, I can either do or, or on yeah, top yeah. of, and things like that, so give us your view as to what, you, yeah. what, what Canonical's seeing and customers as to how you, how you lay out that stack. I think you're right. I think there's a little bit of pathfinding here that needs to be done on the on the Kubernetes side. But ultimately, I think it's going to um, to really converge around uh, you know OpenStack being operator centric and operator friendly, working and operating the infrastructure, scaling that out in a meaningful manner, providing multi tenancy to all the you know different departments, and then having Kubernetes be developer centric and really help to onboard and accelerate the workload adoption and the next gen uh, initiatives. Right. So. You know what we see is is uh, absolutely a use case for Kubernetes and OpenStack to to work perfectly well together, uh, be an extension of each other, possibly also sit next to each other without uh, you know being too uh, 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 too incumbent on there. But I think that ultimately having something like Kubernetes container based uh, developer APIs that are providing that orchestration layer. Uh, the next thing, and they run just perfectly fine on, on, uh, on canonical OpenStack. Yeah, so there certainly has been a lot of talk about that here at the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's see, let's go a level, level above that, things we run on Kubernetes. Right. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, ML and AI and Kube, yeah. Kubeflow. It seems like we're, I'd almost say we're, we're, this is like if this was a movie, we're in a sequel, like, you know, AI, <laughs> you know, five, this time it's real. Yes. Like, I really do see real enterprise applications incorporating these technologies yeah. into the workflow for, for what otherwise might be kind of boring, you know, line of business. business. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the, where yeah. we are in, the, in this revolution? You, you mean, John, only since we've talk, been talking about it since the mid-1800s? <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. I was just going to point that out. I mean, AI is not new, right? Uh, uh, we've, we've seen it since about 60 years, right? It's been around for quite some time. Um, I think that there is an unprecedented uh, amount of uh, sponsorship of new startups in this area, in this space, and there's a reason why this is heating up. I think the reason why uh, ultimately it's there is because um, we're talking about a scale that's unprecedented, right? We thought the biggest problem we had with uh, devices was going to be the IP address that's running out. And it turns out that's not true at all, right? Um, at a certain scale and a certain distributed nature of your rollout, you're going to have to deal with um, just such complexity and interaction between the underlying, the, you know, the under cloud, the over cloud, the, the infrastructure, the, you know, the developers, how do I roll this out? If I spin up 1,000 VMs over here, why am I uh, experiencing drop, call, drop calls over there? You know, so those types of things need to be sort of correlated, they need to be identified, they need to be worked at, so there's a whole operator angle just to be able to cope uh, with, with that whole scenario. 
And I think there's projects uh, you know, uh, uh, that are out there that are trying to ultimately address that, right? For example, Acumus uh, and the Linux Foundation. Um, then there's, of course, the new applications, right? The smart cities, the connected cars, uh, you know, all of those car manufacturers are right now faced with the problem, how do I deal with mobile distributed inference uh, rollout on the edge um, while still capturing the data, continually train my model, update, then again distribute out to the edge, right, to, to get a better experience. How do I, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of catch up to some of the market leaders here that are out there. So as the established car manufacturers are going to come catch up, put more and more uh, uh, miles autonomously on the, you know, on the asphalt, we're going to basically have to deal with a whole lot more of productization uh, of machine learning applications that just have to be managed at scale. And so we believe, uh, and we believe we're also in good company in that belief, that um, you know, having to manage you know, large applications at scale, you know, that containers and Kubernetes, is a great way to do that, right? They did that for web apps, they did that for the next generation applications. Um, this is one example where with the right uh, operators in, in, in mind, the right CRDs, the right uh, frameworks on top of Kubernetes managed correctly, you are actually you know, in a great position um, to, to just go to market with that. Yeah, wondered if you might have a customer example that might be able to walk us through kind of where they are in, in, in this discussion. Right. Uh, talk to many companies, you know, the whole IOT even piece is where we're early in this. Right. So, you know, what's actually real today? How much is planning? Yeah. How many, you know, is this years we're talking before some of these really come to fruition? So, so yeah, I can't, I can't name the customer, but yeah, I, can, yeah. I can say that uh, every single car manufacturer we're talking to is, um, is absolutely interested in the solving the operational problem of running machine learning frameworks uh, uh, you know, as a service. Mm. Um, making sure those are up, running, and up to speed uh, at any given point in time. Spin them up in a multi-tenant fashion. Uh, make sure that the, the GPU enablement is uh, actually done properly at all layers of the virtualization. These are real operational challenges that they're facing today and they're looking to solve with us. Mm. So, yeah, pick a, pick a large car manufacturer, you won't, you know, you won't nice. Well, going down to something that I can type on my own uh, keyboard then <laughs> and go to GitHub, right? The, yeah. the, one of the places to go, right, is, is uh, to run TensorFlow, a, a mm -hmm. machine learning framework on Kubernetes is Kubeflow. I mean, you would talk, you demoed That's that correct. a little bit, uh, yeah. Mark demoed that a little bit yesterday on yes. stage. Um, you want to talk about that, maybe just? Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, that's the core uh, of, of our uh, you know, current strategy right now, where we're looking at Kubeflow as one of the key enablers of machine learning frameworks as a service on top of Kubernetes. And I think they're a great example because they can really, uh, um, you know, they really show how, how that as a service sort of notion can be implemented on top of a virtualization platform, whether that be you know, KVM, pure KVM, on bare metal, or on OpenStack and actually uh, uh, provide machine learning frameworks such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, you know, Selden Core, you have all those um, uh, uh, frameworks being supported, and then basically uh, start mix and matching, right? Um, I think ultimately it's so, um, so interesting to us because the data scientists are really not the ones that are expected to, to manage all this, right? Yet they are at the core of having to interact with it. So, in the next generation of the workloads, we are, we're talking to PhDs in, uh, you, you know, data scientists, they have no interest whatsoever in, in, in understanding how all of this works on the back end, right? They just want to know, this is where I'm, this is where I'm going to submit my artifact that I'm creating, this is how it works in, in, in general, and you know, we, companies pay them a lot of money to do just that, yeah, right. to just do the model, because that's where the, uh, until, until it's found, until the right uh, uh, model is found, that is exactly where the value well, is. That, well, so, that, so Stefan, so does Canonical go talk to the data scientist, or do you, is there a class of operators who are oh, we talked about. facilitating the data oh, scientist? Oh, we talked about, yes. Okay. We talk to the data scientists to understand their problems, we talk mm -hmm. to uh, the operators to understand their problems, and then we work with partners such as Google to try and find solutions to that. Mm -hmm. right. Great. Uh, what kind of conversations are you having here at the show? I, I can't imagine there's mm -hmm. too many of those. Great, great to hear if there are, but yeah. uh, you know, where are they? I, I think you know everybody here knows containers. <laughs> yes. You know, very oh, few wouldn't be know surprised. Kubernetes, and you know how, oh, how far up the uh, stack you, you'd be surprised. Stuff, you'd be they? surprised. Yeah. I mean, we we put this out there, and uh, uh, so far. Uh, I want to say the, the majority of the customer conversations we've had took an AI turn uh, and said, this is what we're trying to do next year, this is what we're trying to do later in the year, this is what we're currently struggling with. So glad you have an approach because otherwise we would spend 
ton of time thinking about this, ton of time trying to solve this in our own way that then gets us stuck in some you know, uh, uh, deep end that we don't want to be. Um, so help us understand this, help us uh, kind of pave the way. Nice, nice. I don't want to leave without talking also about microcates. That's mm -hmm. a, a, a Kubernetes snap. You, you code some code you download, and it can so yeah. talk a little bit about that. That was oh, a new absolutely. announcement. Yeah, yeah but glad to. Um, this was a con uh, an idea that we uh, sort of conceived that came out of this notion of, all right, well, if I do have so talking to a data scientist, if I do have, uh, uh, you know, a data scientist, where does he start? Because Kubernetes you know? is a, has a learning curve to, to date. It does. Yes, yeah, it does. But so, so here's the thing, right? Like you have. Um, as a developer, you have, what options do you have, right, when you get started? You can either go out and, and, and get a, a Kubernetes cluster stood up on one of the public clouds, but what if you're in the plane, right, you, you don't have a connection, you want to work on your local laptop, possibly that, that laptop also has a, a, you know, a GPU, um, and you're a data scientist and you want to try this out, because you know you're going to submit this training job now to a Kubernetes cluster that runs on-prem behind the firewall with a limited training set, right? You know, but all of those, no, like this is the situation we're talking about. So ultimately, the, the uh, motivation for creating microcates was we want just to make this very, very equivalent. And you can deploy Kubeflow on top of microcates today, and it'll run just fine. You get uh, your TensorBoard, uh, you, you have your uh, Jupyter Hub notebook, and you can do your work, and you can do it in a fashion that will then be compatible to your on-prem and public uh, machine learning framework. So that was the original sort of motivation for why we, uh, why we went down this road. But then we noticed, you know what, this is actually uh, you know, a wider need. People are thinking about, uh, you know, a local Kubernetes in many different ways. There are a couple of solutions out there. They tend to be cumbersome, or more cumbersome uh, than, than developers would like it. And so we actually said, you know, maybe we should uh, turn this into a more uh, general uh, purpose solution, so hence microcates. And uh, it's, it's just, it works like a snap. Um, you know, on your machine, you kick that off. You have a Kubernetes API in under 30 seconds or a little longer if your download speed is that, uh, you, you know, is, is it plays, a, plays a factor here. Uh, you enable DNS and you're, you're good to go. Yeah, Stefan, I want to get, just give you the opportunity. Is there anything in the Queen's release that, that it, your customers have been specifically waiting for or any other product announcements uh, before we wrap? Sure. Um, we're very excited about the Queen's release. We think uh, Queen's release is one of, the, um, you know, one of the great examples of the maturity of the code base and really the, the sort of the, the nod towards the operator. And that, I think, was the big challenge in the, you know, in the olden days uh, you know, of, oper uh, of OpenStack where the operators, it took a long time for the operators to be heard and, and sort of to establish that conversation. We're glad to say and to see that OpenStack Queens has matured in that, uh, that respect. And, um, you know, we, we, we like things like Octavia. Uh, you, you know, uh, we're, we're very excited about load balancing as a service, um, taking its own, um, its, its, its own life and, uh, and being treated as a first class citizen. I think that's, it was a great uh, decision of the community to go on that road. And, uh, we'll, we'll, we're supporting it as part of our uh, distribution. All right, well, appreciate the updates. Uh, really, really fascinating to hear about all, all, you know, everybody's thinking about it and really yeah. starting to move on all the ML and AI stuff. All right, for John Troyer, I'm Stu Miniman. Lots more coverage here from OpenStack Summit 2018 in Vancouver. Thanks for watching theCUBE.